Lesson 13. Who are social influencers for Jesus? Part 2. In the last lesson, we looked at a man named Nicodemus. This time we're looking at a woman who has no name. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. He is a religious leader. She's got a past. In every way, they couldn't be more different. And yet Nicodemus, who you would expect to have a wide lane to Jesus, has to come to him at night, in the dark. For John, that's significant, you know. And yet the woman, she doesn't come to Jesus. Jesus goes to her in the light, in, in the middle of the day, the Bible says, at the sixth hour. All of that is significant. And it's turning our expectation on its head of who are the greatest influencers for Jesus. Her story begins in verse 4, when the Bible says Jesus had to go through Samaria. Except that he didn't. Geographically, there was no necessity to go through Samaria. He could have gone down to the Jordan River and followed the Jordan River right up to Galilee. But he went through Samaria. And he had to go through Samaria. Not for geography, but for a meeting with this woman. They get to Samaria, it's the middle of the day, sends the disciples in to get food, and he sits on the well to rest. It's noon. That is not when women normally go to the well. They go in the morning. Which begs the question, why is she there at noon? The best guess is because no one wanted her to be with them. She's avoiding the other women. As you read in her biography, she's had half their husband, so why would they want to fellowship with her? And she walks up, and Jesus is sitting there and says, Woman, give me a drink. And she's stunned. Because Jews don't have dealings with Samaritans. As she said in verse 9, you have, why are you talking to me? Jews have no dealings with us. The word literally is, they don't use together. So you're not going to eat off the same plate. You're not going to drink out of the same well. You're not going to sit at the same table. Why are you even talking to me? And Jesus said, verse 10, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. <laughs> I don't necessarily like the woman's biography, but I love her chutzpah. She says, you think you can give me living water? See, dead water was in a well or a cistern. Living water comes from a spring or a, or a stream. It's moving, therefore it's fresher water. She says, yeah, you don't even have anything to draw with, but all right, yeah, give me some of that living water you think you can give me. And Jesus said, okay. Go call your husband. Oh, that silenced her. If you track how many words she's spoken up till now, she's been pretty chatty. In verse 11 and 12, 42 words. Verse 15, 13 words. Right now, three words. Husband, don't got. She knows that Jesus knows something about her, but she has no idea how he would know that. And so she tries to, well, a lot of people do this, they throw up a smoke screen of theology. Which is the right mountain to worship on? This mountain, Gerizim, or the mountain in Jerusalem? As they look up to Mount Gerizim, they can see the rubble left by John Hyrcanus over a hundred years earlier. He came in and destroyed the rival temple of the Samaritans. There was bad blood between them. And after the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple, the Samaritans then came and brought human bones and threw them about in the temple precincts to defile it. Oh, it was not a pretty sight. And ever since then, there was tension between the two groups. So bringing up this question of where should we worship, here or there, was a smokescreen of sorts. And Jesus says, lady, it doesn't matter where you worship, the time is coming, and then how's now come because of the Messiah that we will worship in spirit and in truth? And again, trying to delay the conversation, she says, yeah, when Messiah comes, he'll sort it all out. Lady, Jesus says, I am the Messiah. And the way he dealt with her convinced her he was. And she wants to convince her fellow villagers, but how can she? Nobody listens to her, not with her background. So she goes to town, and she is so shrewd. She said, I met a man who told me everything I'd ever done. Do you want to hear the stories? Well, most of the guys are going, uh, yeah, we want to hear the stories. And then she says, he couldn't be the Messiah, could he? 
The way she asked the question expected a negative answer, knowing that if she says, he's the Messiah, they'll say, no, he's not. If she says, that's probably not the Messiah, they'll go, well, maybe he is. And they took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. They go out to Jesus, and they have a conversation with him, and they are totally convinced that he is, in fact, the Messiah. By the end of the day, they ask him to stay, and he does for three more days. And by the end of the three days, they give a confession about Jesus that would not be matched until Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Here's what they said at the beginning of his ministry. We are convinced that you are the savior of the world. That's a phrase that you could read on coins for the emperor, the savior of the world. But they're saying it of Jesus, the Messiah in Samaria. Here's the point. Who are the social influencers for Jesus? It's not who you think. It's people with past, with baggage, with doubts, with failures, with fears. They are the ones that because they meet him authentically, because he comes to them and they submit to him, those are the ones, and maybe you're among them, that can make the biggest difference. This woman is the greatest evangelist of all the Gospels, not because of her past, in spite of her past, but because of her faith in Jesus Christ. And you can be too.